Hey everybody, thanks for having me back. Anyone who attend my talk last year here? Obviously Brad, I gotta thank Brad for introducing me to this great community here. So other people there as well? Awesome, thank you again for coming back. Uh, I am Zumo, uh, I just go by Zumo. I am the North America Threat Intel Manager at Cyber Six Skill. And last year I talked uh, about threat hunting at this conference and how to uh, implement a threat hunting program, a CTI program within your organization. And one of the most common questions I got when we got into the dark web and stuff like that was, well, how do you get started in the dark web? How do you safely access it? And how do you engage with threat actors and start extracting intel from there? So that's what this talks about. We're gonna talk about everything from setting up your own dirty machine, your own secured environment to start exploring the dark web. And then of course, we're gonna talk about how to find sources on the dark web. Uh, and as you'll see, I actually just call the underground. Um, and then once we've developed some sources that we, we have interest in, we're gonna actually create our own persona together. And my goal is to give you all the steps today so that you could actually do this yourselves afterwards. Um, but we're gonna do so in a safe manner. And I have two rules is one, don't become a perpetrator, and two, do not become a victim. I have to say that or else the FBI might come knocking on my door later, so. Um, and then once we create our personas, we're gonna actually show some examples of communicating with threat actors and some of the methods that we use. And then we'll, of course, just like last year, we'll do a little bit of a threat hunt at the end together. So, this is probably the only time I'm gonna say dark web or the, the last time I'll say dark web throughout this presentation. I think everyone here probably has a good understanding of what the dark web is, but basically anything that's not indexed by Google. Um, you need a special browser to get access to it. Things like Tor, which is the onion on the bottom left for you. I2P and then ZeroNet, which is a little less popular these days, but there are still some sources that are hosted there. Um, but really, I like to refer to it as the underground because many of you, if you're in Threat Intel or you do your own OSINT, knows that many of these sources aren't just exclusive to the dark web. You can get to plenty of sources just using Google. You can get to, you know, find intel on Reddit, on Twitter, Pastebins, things like that. Um, and then there's also messaging platforms like Telegram, which is a you know, huge platform now for threat actors for any type of use case. Uh, for fraud, terrorism, narcotics even, you could pretty much find a channel for anything on Telegram because it's easy to use. It's very accessible for threat actors of all levels of sophistication, no matter what kind of experience they have. Um, so the, for the rest of this, we're gonna just talk about it as the underground, places where threat actors engage with each other, where they plan, play, and profit uh, from their attacks. And again, my two rules are do not become a perpetrator and definitely do not become a victim. That's the part of the goal of this is to help you set up a secure environment so that you can actually do some of the activities that I engage in safely yourselves. Um, as you'll see here, as an example, uh, this forum might actually look familiar to some of you. Um, if you know what it is, just call it out. Um, but many of the programs that you can click on or you know files that you can download from these sources are malicious. So you might think you're downloading one thing for your research or for you know uh, engineering or whatever, and in fact, you're downloading a malware into your own machine uh, because threat actors are looking to take advantage of anybody. They're not like friends with others on the forum. They will take advantage of anyone that's silly enough to you know click on links like this uh, with their own machine. So always set up a, a dirty machine before you're gonna explore some of these sources and definitely before you start clicking around on these sources. Now, one of my preferred methods of exploring the dark web or the underground is by using a Tails machine. Tails OS is a very lightweight OS that you could just flash onto a drive. Uh, all you need is like eight, gig eight gigabytes of um, storage and you can plug that drive into pretty much any machine and then boot up the Tails OS, which is, uh, has amnesia. So every time you terminate that machine, it's gonna erase everything off of that drive. Uh, it's not magic. You still can't be logging into your Facebook or your bank accounts on it because if you're connecting that, whatever your, your activity on that drive to your personal life, then you know whatever activity you're engaging, it can be traced back to you. So this is meant to 
disassociate everything from your personal machines, from your personal profiles. This is purely meant for your threat intel investigations, your dark web investigations, stuff like that. Um, I have a quick little video here for you to show you booting it up. It's very lightweight. And as you, you can see here, you can actually set persistent storage, but if you set persistent storage, you leave more room for you to get compromised by threat actors in the underground. Uh, by the way, you can get this from me afterwards, so if you want to see these again, I can send the slides so you can send me a message afterwards. Uh, but that's it. That's all it is. There's a few programs on Tails. Uh, it comes with uh, Tor installed, so you can start navigating to those sources uh, right from the beginning. Uh, but again, it's not magic. You still need to put in additional precautions in place and making sure that you're not connecting any of that activity you're, you, you're doing on Tails with your personal uh, self. And we're going to go through those steps here now. Every time I do a video, it, the presentation messes up. There we go. All right, so we have Tails set up or you have a VM set up, something like that, some sort of secure environment where now you can go on tour and just start, start looking around, start trying to find sources, start trying to follow threat actors and gain access to some of these sources. Um, but there are a large variety of sources out there. I come from military, law enforcement background. I spent a lot of my time developing my personas on narcotics, forums, marketplaces, and things like that, taking down narcotics dealers, you know, serious ones like fentanyl dealers and things like that. Um, but there are sources for whatever use case you're interested in, for data leaks, ransomware, malware, um, again, narcotics, fraud, anything like that, you can find a source hosted on the dark web or, again, just a clear web source or a chat group somewhere on Discord, for example. Um, I have some examples here of these sources. Cracks, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, in, in the next few slides, is just a clear web source. You can, it's cracks.pro or something like that. Um, you can find it on Google, and anybody can register for it. It's not very difficult, but there is very sensitive data on this type of source. You can find leaked data for major enterprises. You can find vulnerability information, malicious programs, people trying to hack their ex-girlfriend's Facebook accounts. Whatever it is, you can find it on forums that all look relatively the same. These look probably very similar to sources that you might uh, go to for your own hobbies, like a biking forum or something like that. That's all this is. Then you have credit card markets. Fraud is one of the number one um, use cases that we're extracting intel from in all of our organizations, uh, especially in law enforcement. Uh, but there are plenty of sources that are just dedicated fraud markets where you can purchase anybody's compromised payment card. Um, these, you know, they're listing thousands of payment cards a day, uh, and you can buy somebody's account for as little as a dollar and start using their credit card information to commit fraud. Then we have your miscellaneous markets, your drug markets, which is, again, where I spent a lot of my time uh, back in the Silk Road days. Uh, but this one you can see here, which is known as Dark Fox, is a source where you could buy anything from narcotics to pornography to even just legitimate stuff. Um, it's a site like an Amazon where it just hosts vendors that could sell whatever they want anonymously. Um, but, but there are plenty of markets like this. This is just one of those examples. Russian market. How, how many people are familiar with Russian market? A couple of hands there. This is what we call an initial access broker. Probably for anybody in Threat Intel in this, uh, that is here today, uh, this is probably one of your biggest pains in the asses that you're hearing about every single day, compromised access for sale on the dark web. This is probably the notorious market. There was many others like it, but this is definitely the most popular one where you can just simply go in and buy an account to pretty much any domain you can think of. Um, they're, they're available every single day for, again, as little as a dollar. And we'll talk more about this when we get into the threat hunting later on. And then lastly, Telegram. 
as I mentioned earlier, you can find a Telegram channel for anything, whether it's fraud, uh, narcotics, leaks, malicious programs, gaming, uh, again, whatever hobby, fishing, whatever you want, you can connect with people around the world. Uh, and it's so popular with threat actors because of how easy it is to use and how accessible it is. Um, so this is uh, one of those places that we're constantly finding access to and engaging with threat actors and communicating with them after we've connected with them on a forum somewhere. Now, when it comes to dark web sources, there's a bit of a challenge here. One, most sources, you know, the popular ones you could probably find pretty easily these days, um, but most sources are pretty difficult to find, and that there's a reason for that. People are trying to remain anonymous, right? Um, and you actually need the whole onion link, which is that link highlighted here. A little difficult to see for you guys, but again, you can get these slides from me afterwards, and I think it's being recorded as well. Um, but you need the actual onion link or one of the mirrors to get to these sources. You can't just Google, you know, Crip BB uh, and, you know, get a result where you could just log in. You need that link. There's different ways to find those links. I'll show you one in a few slides. Um, but there are some sources that will host links to these, uh, to these dark websites or these onion links. Typically, though, uh, these sources are look, normally listing drug sites. It's one of the most popular reasons why threat actors or people in general are going to the dark web is to buy drugs. Uh, it's very easy to buy drugs on the dark web. That's why I had a job in law enforcement for so long. Um, but there are sources like the Hidden Wiki, Shadow Wiki, Dark Eye, Darknet Live, many others as well, um, it's constantly coming up and you know, oftentimes going down as well, that will host these links where you can simply just click on it or you know, see the mirrors for those sources uh, and then start you know, exploring these sources. But again, they're mostly for narcotic sites or fraud sites you'll, you'll often see. Those sites that we, ty we typically use for threat intel leak sites, ransomware sites, things like that, usually it's a little bit more difficult to find those links. But if you're going deep enough into Reddit or you go on Twitter or you're active on another source, maybe not a dark web source, but some other forum, you'll have an easier time of finding these, these links uh, to these sources. As you can see here, this is an example where oftentimes threat actors on just a normal clear web source will advertise another source that they're active on, or in this case, this threat actor was advertising their own Telegram channel where they were uh, posting uh, data leaks and um, combos for uh, credential stuffers and things like that. So oftentimes, you just need to participate on some of these forums and stay up to date on the post to find links like this to find, oh, here's another source that threat actors are frequenting uh, pretty often. Now, oftentimes, finding the source is not enough. You have to register for them, right? And this is why persona management is so important, because we're not going to register for a malicious source with our Gmails, right? We, we can't be letting these threat actors know who we are. One, most of the time they don't care who you are, uh, but they will ban you uh, if they don't think you're contributing to the source. Uh, but, you know, worse, they could actually target you. So registering the for to, the to these sources can be pretty difficult, especially because many of them require invites or access codes, things like that. Genesis was one of those competing initial access brokers, probably one of the first ones uh, before Russian Market came online. Uh, I was particularly proud of this one because I was one of the first people, one of the thir first Threat Intel people in this source. Uh, and this was a source where, again, you needed to know the admin to get an invite, or you needed to pay a significant fee uh, to get access to. I, uh, having my, all my personas from law enforcement, got into this one pretty quickly and then was able to make a bunch of burner accounts just in case that one got uh, banned. Forum Ramp, which is a Chinese and Russian speaking forum primarily, although they mostly speak English on the source, is another example of a dark web forum where you need to, again, know the admin or in most cases actually just pay the fee. Uh, quick note for any 
threat intel analysts or threat hunters that do this manually, never use your own funds to pay act, to get access to these sources. You will get burned. We've been burned before. I've been burned before. Uh, where you pay a fee and then you never get your access, or you know you get scammed or something like that. So never use your own sources. Make your companies pay for that. And then back to Cracks Pro, which uh, is a pretty easy source to get registered for. But in this, the issue with this source is you need to actually participate or contribute to the forum. Now, again, my first rule is to not become a perpetrator. So we're not going to engage in criminal activity, right? Um, FBI has some pretty good guidelines on what you're allowed to do, what are gray areas, and what you should not do at all. Um, but this source, you need to actually participate to be able to get access to everybody else's posts. Um, a quick, quick little tip. Threat actors like to know what's going on in the world. So an easy way to get around this is just share articles. You can go on a source and, you know, CISO comes in, you know, screaming about some new vulnerability that's being reported on. You could simply just share the CNN link about that um, vulnerability. And uh, that's usually good enough for these admins on these sources. Uh, you have to post it in the right section. They are pretty uh, picky about where you post information. They don't want you to be on like the leak girlfriend's Facebook's tab and you're posting vulnerability stuff. Um, but it's usually good enough for you to get around these requirements so that you can actually see uh, what other people are posting and trying to extract whatever intel you're looking for. The next obstacle, which is becoming a bit of an easier obstacle to hurdle over, uh, are language barriers. Many of these sources, um, in most of, some of the most sophisticated threat actors in the world, are Russian, Chinese, uh, but that's not it. You know, there's German, Italian, uh, you know, Arabic, plenty of other languages out there that are using the underground to engage in malicious activity. Again, I was a Korean linguist in the military. Unfortunately, Koreans don't like to use the dark web at all, so I don't really get to have any fun with that or practice Korean anymore. Um, I have to do it legitimately. But um, you can find pretty much any language or dedicated source for that region uh, of threat actor in the underground. And that's one of the barriers that you're going to have to deal with or obstacles you're going to have to deal with because not everybody targeting your company speaks English, right? Uh, they're speaking many other languages, and you need to be able to, to see that to be able to identify the threats that uh, your organization might have. And then there's also VIP sections. Anyone familiar with raid forms? One, two, couple, rest in peace. Um, raid forms went down, was taken down by law enforcement, I guess probably a year and a half ago now or something like that. Couple have taken its place, uh, was a form that was around for a really long time. Um, and I was sad because I had personas on that form that were just specific to that form that I can't really use anymore. Um, but there was an example of a form where just gaining access wasn't enough. You need to also, again, participate in the form or know sophisticated threat actors on that site or significant threat actors to actually get access to the VIP section. Or you could just pay your way too. Um, but there are many sources like this where they'll have VIP sections where the, you know, the most precious intel for us is actually located. Um, so when, as you're exploring these sources, it's something to keep note of if there are locked areas of that forum uh, where it's just typically where you're trying to get your intel from. So we've set up our, our uh, dirty machine. In this case, I'm using Tails. Now, again, Tails is very good for your just one-off investigations. If it's something you're looking to automate, then you're going to have to look into other methods like a VM, uh, a dedicated VM that you can set up. Um, Tails is not really meant for that. It's, you know, it was really meant for journalists and people behind enemy lines being able to communicate what's going on without risking themselves. Um, uh, but whatever method you have, as long as you have some sort of secure environment that you've set up, and now you've identified some sources that you want to get access to, we need to actually create our own persona. <clears throat> and for our persona, I actually modeled off of a threat actor. I have many personas, but for this example, I created a brand new one just so that you guys can learn from this. 
uh, and you can learn from the requirements that I built here for this persona. But you, all you need to really do is model it after any other threat actor that you see on these sources. You know, the best ones aren't, you know, the most popular threat actors, but the ones that are using the most uh, forms of communication or are active on a multiple sources so that you can kind of blend in and model after them. So some of the requirements that you're going to use are a burner email. In this case, I just use ProtonMail. It's usually my go-to. Uh, you're definitely not going to use Gmail or anything like that that requires you to verify who you are. Um, a password manager. I almost hesitate telling you this because I believe the best way to learn things is through pain. I still try and do that. Um, but if you don't use a password manager, you risk uh, logging into a site that is no longer legitimate, uh, and then you lose access to all your other personas. So don't do that. Use a password manager and do not reuse passwords. Um, Make sure your persona is completely isolated from the real you because, we're, again, we're not going to become a victim, right? And then we're going to use other uh, communication methods like PGP, which I'll show you an example of, Jabber, Telegram, uh, and then one other, which we'll go through. So this is Pitiful. This is me. You, could find, you can actually find Pitiful. Uh, and a challenge that you could do if you follow these steps afterwards is actually try and contact me. You could contact me at Proton, at pitiful at proton.me. The L's in full are ones, just uh, FYI. You can find me on Jabber, pitiful at xmpp.jp. I will warn you, though, I don't always have Jabber pulled up on my machine. So if you reach out to me there, I might not get back to you right away. On forums, I'm not going to tell you which forums, though you'll get a hint later. Uh, you'll just find me on Pitiful. On Telegram, which is probably the easiest way to get in touch with me, is at Pitiful. And then here's my PGP fingerprint. So this is our persona that we're going to run with for the next few slides. And again, these are some of the requirements that you can follow yourselves when trying to set up your own persona. By the way, I love pit bulls, so if you didn't know. So for this example, I created this per persona following uh, Jack Lowe, who is a, not a very significant threat actor. It's not like a notorious hacker or anything like that. It's just some random person um, that I found on a carding forum known as Card Villa that uh, has profiles across various sources and is using multiple contact methods. As you can see, it's a little hard for you to see, but on the bottom right there, you can see... Jack Lowe is also known as Baker B and Ya Fufalo and Fountain as well. Um, and I have a, a gathering tool, so it's a little bit easier for me to do now than it was back in the day. Uh, but typically, if you're just on a forum, any forum of your choice, and you click on a threat actor's post, you'll be able to see the contact details that they're sharing about themselves so that anybody can get in contact with them, especially if they're selling services. They're always listing their contact information. So in this case, I, I chose Jack Lowe because he was just you know, the easiest one to find on this particular source that I chose. And he was using, uh, he or she uses a variety of contact methods, aliases. So I thought, hey, this is a perfect example of somebody I should model after. You could do this too, using a threat actor of your choice, um, or you could just follow the guide that I, I created with Pitiful. <clears throat> now, Jack Lowe, as we saw, shared their Jabber ID and their Telegram, which is BakerB221 at xmpp.jp and BakerB221 at Telegram. And using those investigative leads, is a term we like to use in law enforcement and threat intel, um, uh, I was able to find more sources where this threat actor was active on. As you can see here, there was a list of, was that, six forums. Uh, a couple of them dark web exclusive ones. Most of them are just, you know, you can use Google to get to. Uh, but also 10 or so profiles that this threat actor used itself. So it's not really a big deal if you don't utilize the same uh, moniker or profile name across your sources. But if you're looking to develop your persona, a, a single persona, and trying to gain trust with threat actors, I do recommend utilizing the same moniker. 
Otherwise, just make sure you're using the same contact details across that profile or across those profiles, similar to what Jack Lowe did here. Uh, we found them as Jack Lowe on Card Villa, um, but you can see it goes by Baker B, Fountain, I, some of those I can't pronounce, Ranger Z, all these different creative names. Um, and here's another example where these threat actors are often sharing these contact details in their posts. So all you need to do is a little bit of digging, just clicking on posts, following a threat actor, looking at their activity to find more sources, more contact methods, things like that. At the bottom of their post here, on the form known as Altenen, not a very popular source, but you can find some intel on there. Um, you can see that they shared their <clears throat> Telegram, their Jabber, and again, I don't know why, but this guy's using Outlook and Gmail as well. For If I was still in law, law enforcement, I'd be like, this is easy, we're gonna find this guy in no time. Uh, don't use your Gmails to, to uh, create your personas. Now we're gonna set up these modes of communication we discovered. We found Jabber, right? PGP, Telegram. <clears throat> And we're also going to utilize just a plain old private messaging on the forum. Take a sip of water one sec. So we're going to set up these modes of communications. I'm going to show you some examples of these just to show you how easy they are to use. And for PGP, it's a little bit more difficult uh, or it just takes a little bit more time uh, getting comfortable with. So I'll show you a live example of that as well. The first one we have up is Telegram. Many of you probably already use Telegram, but we're not gonna use your actual Telegram address to conduct investigations, right? Now, there's some challenges with that. You need a burner phone. Me, I have the privilege of working with people overseas, so it's much easier for us to set up a burner phone than it is for somebody in the US now, because pretty much burner phones or pay-as-you-go phones are kind of going away. But you might get lucky and find something else. Otherwise, you can use other services that might be available out there. But for us, we're using um, burner phones to create Telegram accounts with separate numbers of that, than our own. Um, and as you can see, Telegram is just a simple chat group. And again, no matter the use case, no matter the type of threat you're looking for, there is a channel out there on Telegram for you. Very easy to use. Also very easy to go unnoticed because oftentimes you could just join a group that's got hundreds of thousands of people in the group but you don't have to say a word. You kind of just observe what's going on in there. Um, unless, you know, again, back in, although I don't think Telegram was back uh, when I left law enforcement, um, but you don't really have to participate at all unless you're trying to do a buy or something like that. <clears throat> the cons of Telegram are, there's a lot of users with similar monikers. So if you know of a threat actor, maybe you haven't seen the exact name, but you heard of what his, his or her moniker was, and you're trying to find him, there could be a list of 100 monikers that are very similar, so it's difficult to figure out who is who, uh, and you're not gonna just go and messaging each person trying to figure out who they are, right? There's also lots of groups, um, very groups with very similar names, so that can be another challenge. Another challenge is that sometimes the names are like emojis and stuff, which I don't know how to search in emoji. Um, so that could be a challenge when trying to find groups for your threat intel. And then lastly, you need a burner phone because we're not gonna use our own personal numbers to sign up for Telegram to do our threat hunting. <clears throat> Next, we have private messaging. Pretty much any source you go on, uh, whether it's clear, deep, or dark, there's gonna be some form of private messaging on that form. It's the easiest method to use when communicating with threat actors. Um, it's frequently used on all the, you know, everything back from the raid form days to now it's, uh, it was breached and then breach and now it's like pwn forms and there's like all these, you know, they all look exactly the same. They just have a new admin that hasn't been arrested yet, basically. Um, but they all usually have the, a private messaging chat uh, feature on there that you can use. The issue being threat actors can save your chats on those sources, which if you're engaging with them and all of a sudden they think you're a narc 
or you said something that they don't like, they could flag your profile. And then that could lead to getting blocked or people targeting you. So it's not a method that I particularly uh, recommend, but it is a, a something that is available to you if there's no other options. <clears throat> you can also get banned using this uh, because you know who knows what the admins are looking at, what's happening on their sources. So if they see some chatter going on between you and somebody else, they could just ban you, or again, you can get flagged by one of the other threat actors on that source. Uh, but it's pretty simple. Again, I'm sure there's plenty of forums-like sites that you that you all frequent, um, whether it's Reddit or a hobby site or something like that. It's a pretty easy thing to use. And, you know, it's typically just a message box, and every time you send a message or receive a message, you get a little notification. That's all there really is to it. Problem with that, another problem with that is you can only communicate with the threat actors on that source, which is something that Jabber uh, gets us around. <clears throat> Jabber is just a messaging client that you can use and communicate with anybody that has a Jabber address. And oftentimes I communicate with threat actors on sources that I'm not even active on or don't have a profile on. I just know they have a Jabber so I can communicate with them anyway. It's pretty easy to create. Um, I, in this slide, the next slide, there's a list of Jabber servers that you can use. My recommendation is use xmpp.jp, the most consistent one. <clears throat> uh, and you don't have to link any uh, accounts for verification to your Jabber address with that specific server. Uh, and then lastly, again, the pro here is that you can communicate with threat actors regardless of what source you're active on. The cons are, Sometimes it's difficult to reach threat actors because, like me, it's not something that I just have pulled up all the time or running. Uh, it's typically when I'm engaging in some sort of activity, I'll have it pulled up. Otherwise, it's not on. So that's why if you're going to try and reach out to me, I recommend using one of the other methods I showed earlier. Because uh, you can quite often miss uh, your messages. And depending on what server you're on, that server might delete messages automatically. So, and often, oftentimes before you even see it. Uh, so it could be a kind of challenging if you're dealing with a threat actor that only uses Jabber. And then lastly, some Jabber servers are just inconsistent. Exploits, for example, is like, it's one it's almost impossible to connect to. It's either, it, you know, if it's up when you're doing some sort of investigation, you're like the luckiest person in the world, you should go play the Powerball. <clears throat> And here's a, just a, one example of a Jabber communication I had with a threat actor. This is actually probably about three years ago now. Um, I was, it was uh, with a threat actor that was selling uh, French bank data. Uh, so and I was trying to communicate with them to figure out which bank it was. Turns out it was multiple banks. Uh, but simple plain text uh, chatting program. And again, there's a couple different clients that you can use with Jabber. Uh, again, you can get the list here. Uh, of different servers, list at .jabber.at. Again, you can get these slides from me afterwards. And the client that I like to use for Windows, at least, is Pigeon. I don't know if Pigeon works on Mac uh, or iOS, so you might have to look for a different client. But there are plenty of clients that you can load a Jabber account onto and start using for your messaging. These slides uh, have tips on setting up your pigeon. Again, just get the slides from me afterwards. You can follow this um, uh, yourselves. Next, we have PGP. Now, PGP, as for those that don't know, is a great encryption <clears throat> messaging uh, method. It's very secure, uh, and only one recipient can decrypt your messages, unless that recipient shares the message, of course, or their key has been compromised. Um, but what I have found with PGP over the years, especially in law enforcement, is if you were going through the trouble of com uh, communication, communicating through PGP, uh, threat actors often revealed more information or trusted you faster than if you were just PMing them on a forum. Usually they're not going to give you the sensitive data just through a uh, private messaging feature on a forum. Um, with PGP, they tend to give you more details. The cons are PGP is a little bit difficult to get uh, comfortable with, depending on which method you're using. There are multiple different ways you can use PGP. Um, it takes a bit longer to communicate with threat actors. And if you lose your key, you lose all your messages. Uh, so that's a big issue, of course. 
But really, it just takes a, a, some practice to get um, comfortable with. And I have an example here of using PGP. I used it with, uh, using a tool known as Cleopatra, Cleo with a K. Let me restart that from the beginning. And all we're doing here is this key block, this is a uh, threat actor's public key block. I'm just simply taking their key block and I'm copying it to my clipboard. <clears throat> and then within Cleopatra, I'm actually uploading that key block and saving it to uh, the threat actor. So now I can send them messages. I'm just writing here, hey, I love you, thank you for the dumps. And I'm simply gonna copy that message and I'm going to encrypt it with their public key. You can see I'm clicking through, just encrypting with that key that I've uploaded. Once I hit next here, it's gonna automatically encrypt that message and it's automatically saved to your clipboard. So now I could just paste over this plain text message <clears throat> and now you can see the encrypted message here, which just says begin PGP message, it's the encryption and then end message. So the next thing you would do here is send that block to the recipient and they would decrypt your message using their private key. Um, and then if they need to send a message back to you, they would take your public key, encrypt a message, send it to you, and then you would decrypt with your private key. So don't lose your private keys because um, you won't be able to see what they wrote. Uh, but it's really not that difficult. It just takes practice. And again, the advantage you get here is that threat actors will, they tend to be more trusting when you're communicating with them over this. Uh, they're not worried about you leaking data or leaking whatever they're saying to you. Um, so I do encourage you to utilize this method when in engaging in your threat hunts and threat actor activity. So we've set up our methods. We have our, our new persona, although it's very young, uh, and early on in its dark web activities. But now what do we do? We're actually gonna utilize this for threat hunting and finding threats before they find us. That is all threat hunting is. It's a constant game of cat and mouse. We've went up through all this trouble of researching threat actors, researching methods, finding sources, getting registered to those sources. Now we actually need to utilize these personas. And some of the threats, the most common threats that you're going to find in the underground are initial access, <clears throat> phishing threats, supply chain compromise, valid accounts for sale, insider threats, fraud, data leaks, vulnerabilities, narcotics, so on and so forth. Pretty much anything that you're looking for you could find, uh, but you want to be more targeted in what you're actually looking for rather than just kind of moseying around hoping that you'll stumble on something. Manual threat hunting is time consuming. So keep this in mind that this is a journey you're going on. This is not a quick wins type investigation. It's gonna take you some time to set up your personas. It's gonna take you some time to find sources where you believe there's intel for you on. Uh, so keep that in mind. And you're also gonna bang your head against the wall when you have to deal with these damn captchas uh, and queue lines like on Dredd. Dredd's like a Reddit style forum. Uh, on the dark web. Pretty, pretty interesting one, honestly, but again, it's kind of a pain because they will often put you in queues, as you can see here, and then oftentimes your queue gets in interrupted, and then you gotta start over again, and all of a sudden you're at the end of the line. Or they give you impossible captures like this, which I still cannot solve, because uh, I, I have to read digital time these days, um, but you'll have impossible ones like this that you'll keep retrying and retrying and retrying, and even if you know you're right, it says you're wrong, and then you'll just never get access. Um, I think they put that, they do that on purpose. But, and then other times is that these sources are often unstable. Uh, you have competitor forums or marketplaces that are attacking these sources, trying to bring them down to get all their user base. You have law enforcement that's coming down. You have shady host providers. Um, so these sites are very inconsistent. So an important step when you're engaging in your threat hunts is that if you do find evidence, save it, because there's no promise that that source is gonna be active tomorrow when your CISO's like, hey, where was that evidence again? Because if you didn't take a screenshot it, you know it's there, but the site's down. Now you can't get it, and ha-ha to you. Um, so make sure that you are 
taking screenshots or actually documenting because oftentimes you'll find that a source that was always active is now suddenly inactive. And you can thank the law enforcement uh, operators for taking it down from you. <clears throat> so tell a little bit of story to kind of help with putting this all together. I'm not picking on racetrack here. Uh, they just happen to be somebody, an organization that I see all the time when I'm getting onto the highway from my house. Um, but racetrack was compromised by the clock group. And their tens of their gigabytes of data was made public back in July of 2022. That information included employee tax information, financial records, customer data, all a whole bunch of different stuff that was that was just dumped publicly on their source. Uh, and in this example, Klopp was actually reaching out to the victims that they compromised individually to inform them of the breach and not just like posting it somewhere on a source. So that just further hurt the brand's reputation and also pissed off a lot of people. But if we use this as an example, how might we have used our personas to help find the threat before it turned into something like this where it was a ransom or compromise. So that's why we're gonna combine our personas with our threat hunting skills and try and find these threats before they take advantage of us. One of the most easiest things to find in the underground is leak credentials. Whether it's on Telegram, it's on a forum, or it's on a pavement somewhere, you will find Plenty of different lists of credentials. Sometimes it's hidden behind a link. Most of the time it's just hidden. It's just posted in plain text. But there are plenty of examples of credentials leaked every single day, probably millions per day uh, that are leaked to the underground. Oftentimes they're recycled, uh, but that's okay. What we're looking for is evidence uh, and, and risk that might be out there in the underground. In this case, I was able to find a bunch of racetrack credentials. Here's just a snippet. Just by having access to a couple of sources where we could see racetrack employee emails and passwords, which I did, of course, blur out, um, that were dumped uh, from Steeler Locks and one example from a data leak. These are things that you could, again, just grab from a pastebin or just logging into a form. It's probably the first post you'll see is the most recent leak credentials that somebody's sharing on the ground. One of the most common threats that you're coming across, but it's still an, an important threat because you need to know what threats are out there and what risks to your organization exist. In this case, these emails, obviously a threat actor could test the credentials to see if they can get access to the, to the account, or they could just use the email now in a phishing attack and target them with something more um, significant, like a ransomware link, right? In fact, I did a search across a variety of different sources, and these were all the sources in just a month's time frame, which you can get from this uh, presentation and start trying to get access to yourselves, um, where racetrack employee emails were found, again, just in a month. You can see at the top, breach, which is no longer up, uh, but there were 62 results from that source alone, cracked having 61, and then so on, so forth down the list here. So it's, this show, just shows why it's important to, one, have access to these sources, but also be looking for intel on the sources. Here's another example of just uh, when it came to leaked Steeler logs that contained racetrack employee information, 150 results in a month. That's a lot, and especially if you're doing this manually and you're only one person conducting these types of investigations, it can be a bit overwhelming. But at least you know that it exists, and if there are this many results out there, then maybe that starts impacting policy uh, and additional security measures that you can put in place because you can't deal with these one, one by one, so you better implement some policy to help protect your organization. <clears throat> An example of uh, oftentimes logs or credentials are hidden within, you know, behind a link. You know, it's a file you gotta download. And this is just emphasizing again to make sure you are conducting this on some secure environment. Don't do this on your work laptop. Don't do this on your personal machine. You need a secure environment because you will find up uh, examples where you need to download a link uh, or a file to be able to extract the intel uh, uh, or the threats that are targeting your organization. 
This is an example here. It was a steel log file, it was two, two gigs worth, and there was a bunch of intel, not only for Racetrack, but other organizations within this file. And this is very often the case that, you know, uh, a barrier or obstacle that you have to go around in order to get that intel. Here's an example from Russian market. Uh, where you could see somebody that has access to racetrack.octo.com was compromised and listed for sale. And I believe I have a live example here. This is the actual marketplace itself. It's not like in some you know, crazy format because it's all dark web. It's not spooky or anything. It's just like a blue version of Amazon, basically, um, where, again, you simply just go to these marketplaces, and oftentimes you'll see experienced threat actors, less experienced threat actors using these markets themselves to gain that initial access rather than trying to go create it themselves um, or you know, pen testing or trying to get access to the source to that target in another way. They'll simply just come to these markets and pay. Uh, they'll search for a, a particular URL or domain uh, and then just see if there's anybody's account that's for sale and just simply pay 10 bucks or a dollar and gain their passwords, their usernames and passwords, and sometimes they'll even get their, their session cookies to try and hijack the session. Uh, of course, I didn't uh, provide the racetrack employees details here, but once you purchase the account for sale, you'll just get a plain text file like this back. It usually has a little stamp of the info stealer that was used, in this case was Redline. Uh, and then you'll just have a few lines the first line being the URL or subdomain that was compromised or where the account has access to. And then you'll have the username and password, which you can see my very strong password here at the bottom. And that's what threat actors get when they purchase this. And then from there, they can try and log in. Um, in uh, the case of like Uber, for example, oftentimes that's not enough. They'll need to uh, employ some other type of uh, threat or uh, attack like social engineering, for example, to get, it, to get access to that account. But this is at least a starting point for them to try and get access to that, or, that network and perform some sort of attack. So the benefits of persona management. One, you get access to exclusive information and you can get access to that information prior to an attack actually happening. Oftentimes, as we saw here, Threat actors are just selling the data. They gather it, but they're not actually looking to utilize it to take advantage of you. They're just selling it to somebody else to take advantage of you. So if you're not popular or your organization is not popular, uh, oftentimes you can get that information off the underground before a threat actor gets their hands on it and mitigate that issue before it becomes a greater attack. Also, just being active on these sources allows you to gain an understanding of the tactics and techniques that threat actors are using every single day. You can also get an understanding of different tools that they might be utilizing, tools that they're developing, identify trends and things like that. Of course, you could track data leaks, which is important for with all the supply chain compromise going on. Maybe it's a, a vendor or a partner that you're using and you see their data leaked on there. You can I, you know, identify if there's any risk to your organization by tracking those data leaks and seeing if any sensitive information for your organization was also exposed. And also, you could quickly attribute attacks to threat actors that you might be familiar with now because you're engaging with them. You're not just reading some blog about threat actors or threat groups. Instead, you're on the sources that where these threat researchers gathering their intel from in the first place. So you're able to have your own perspective on these threats uh, and be able to um, communicate with your organization some of the issues that you're seeing with these, uh, with these sources. So I didn't want to just end it on that. I, am do I, I created a little sneak peek of what I plan to do next year for B-Sides, which is similar to initial access. We're downloading a bunch of tools, basically, that threat actors are using uh, that we've uh, identified with our own personas. And we're going to demonstrate how easy these tools are and why they're so popular in the underground. The first one being a very popular credential stuffing tool known as Open Bullet. I'm not a hacker. I'm a script kitty at best. Uh, I can copy and paste tools and follow a guide and figure out how to use them, right? Um, and that's a lot of cases, in a lot of cases, threat actors are doing themselves. So we did that same thing, uh, my buddy and, my, and I, 
uh, and we did that with OpenBullet. The thing about OpenBullet is not only are threat actors in the underground use, using this tool every single day, they're also getting every other piece of information they need to run the tool from the underground. In this case, all you need is a target, so who you're gonna attack, combo list, username and passwords, you can, get, you can find a ton of those combo lists, and a configuration file. Basically, a, a file that just automates an attack to the target that you're, you're targeting. Um, and to show you how popular this tool is, in just a month's time frame, there was 101,000 mentions of this tool across the underground. This is you know, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of sources, but you could see how often it's coming up in conversations across these sources. So we went out and we downloaded the tool. It's, it's available on GitHub, um, very, you know, very accessible, and another reason why threat actors are using it. But we went out and tested it ourselves and was able to capture how easy it is to do in just a minute and 40 seconds. So I have my Kali machine here. I'm gonna boot up OpenBullet. And again, I can provide this afterwards. I know it's probably tough for you to see here. <clears throat> so it's booting up, and I'm a UI guy. I'm not a terminal guy, so I like to open it up in a nice little UI, <clears throat> which OpenBullet comes with. First thing we're, to, we're gonna do, instead of actually downloading a config from a threat actor, we're just gonna create our own to show how easy it is to do. And we're gonna build a simple HTTP request to a site known as DemoBlaze. It's basically like a marketplace that you can just test your automation on pretty much. Um, and that's pretty much exactly what we did here, is we created a config to send requests, a login request basically, to DemoBlaze. I did create my own combo list, which is, it contains three username and password combinations separated by a colon. But again, you can find these in any old dump on, across the underground. It's just usernames and passwords separ by, separated by a colon that we're gonna upload into OpenBullet. And then we're gonna create a job. And what we're doing here is we're simply hitting start or play. And it, what it's doing is sending these requests to DemoBlaze using that list of combinations that we've loaded in. And within, this was a very small list, so it took like a second. Um, but within a second, it tested all three accounts. And that little green line here at the bottom showed the account that it successfully hit on, which was my test account, and showed that it successfully logged in using that, those details. So that's kind of just a little snippet of what to expect next year if you, if you all would have me back. So more to come with that. But yeah, just a little glimpse of what, what's to come. Appreciate you all coming out. If you have any questions that you don't wanna ask right away, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. If you're not comfortable with QR codes, I think I'm the only Michelangelo Zumo on LinkedIn, so it's, I'm not hard to find. But please feel free to send uh, me a message or communicate with me. I'd be happy to send you slides afterwards as well. So thank you.